who yeah, was on the defensive end here out of the opening against Zion Friedman. The bishop got traded, bishop to f5, pawn to e4. Bit of a weakening, but white had to keep the pawn and trying to gain some time here. Takes, takes bishop to e6. Zion probably quite happy here. Very stable position. Not any serious weaknesses that meet the eye. While well, it's white who has to fight, keep everything under control. Meanwhile, the black position more or less plays itself. Put the rooks on the open file. See if there are any targets here that can be captured later. Very unpleasant situation for Keimer. Just to desperately find a way to mix it before Freeman goes rook d3, rook d8, or rook d7, rook d8. It increases the pressure to unbearable amounts. But what can white do? Bring the king? Does that make sense? Doesn't really do much. Rook d3 is still very powerful. Say here, here. Pressure just keeps building. Nothing hanging right now, but black has various ways to keep grabbing space. Well, for white, it's very unclear what he could do next. So, Kaima plays rook to c3, covering the d3 square at least, and Friedman goes rook d7. Its position is so easy to play. Just getting ready to double up here. Continue to ask questions. Also, if we look at the clock. Vincent, with 8 minutes, 23 seconds, versus 38 minutes for Daniel Friedman, who just keeps leaning back, makes strong logical moves quickly, watching his young compatriot, trying to stay in the game. Vincent does not look happy. Looking for some activity, but where to find it? Was that rook to b2? Not sure that can be defined as active, but it keeps an eye on the d2 knight. Friedman goes, no, I don't think he played rook c8. I think it's this thing we had before where the piece didn't go all the way. He goes rook a8, which looks way more natural. Doubling the rooks on the open file. Yeah, not really helping. What's happening? Mic problems? Thank you. King f2, bringing the king. Now is the first time. So Daniel made all the natural moves. He has to figure out what to do next. But space grabbing operations on either side look very tempting. Pawn to a5, trying to freeze these pawns here. Or even pawn to g5, using tactics. This can't be taken. This would be under attack. Black would threaten pawn to g4. Also looks fairly unpleasant. Other than the tactical threat, it's also useful, I guess, for black to rearrange his pawns to be on dark squares. Typically, if you have a light square bishop, you want your pawns on dark squares. That's what they taught me. In chess school. So, Vincent Keimer, trying to hang in here. Not a great start for the German number one, but we have a lot of action, or a lot of simplifications, I should say, in the Maxim Vashila Graf versus Ding Liren game. So let's see how that happens. Knight takes e4, d takes e4, queen to g4. 
Rook a8 as expected, threatening f6. Yeah, pawn to b3 was played. So this knight has a retreat square on c4. Case gets hit, does get hit. Pawn to f6, knight to c4. Bishop takes f4, exchanging the bishops. Queen takes, queen takes. Ah, that's how all the material vanished. Bishop takes c4, pawn takes. And all of a sudden, we have a rook end game. C takes d4. Maxime taking a moment here, probably trying to figure out which pawn to capture. This one or this one. Both look possible. This is not really a pawn sacrifice because of the d takes c. Guess he would regain that pawn with rook c1. Although you could hear the doubt in my voice because that's rook, rook d8 or rook b8. And black would have to keep an eye on his back rank. So c takes d4 looks more normal. When Ding at least is comfortable, I don't know if he's better, but he could just play f5. It does have double pawns, but this pawn is a bit weak. So rook d8 will create a target. Rook to b8 is also there. So at the very least, no problems for the world champion. If he has an advantage, is up for debate. Computer is giving the good old 0-0 zero, zero with both c takes d4 or rook takes e4. Probably no reason to unduly worry for the MVL fans out there. And it is white. Best to proceed with care here. And we can see Maxim taking his time, trying to figure out what to take. She probably wouldn't do if he was just happy. But position after C takes D4. He's empty. Come on, Maxime, take a pawn. You know, Sheila Graf, former Blitz World Champion. Thing. Seems to have things under control. Not looking at the board. He's checking out the other games on the screen above him. You can see from Maxime's shirt, it's an OSG Baden-Baden shirt, which is also sponsored by Granke, as is this event. Maxime is part of the family here many times. German team champion with the OSG Baden-Baden. Still hasn't figured out which, which pawn to take. This one. This one. Just can't decide. My mind is on C takes D4. Why complicate matters unduly? But he does, does seem to dislike this position. What is this? Why play some normal move like rook b1? Rook d8 is unpleasant. Eh? We cover. Now black just doubles. White can't can't go passive to keep keep his material. He's on the best moves for white, but just checking if you do. He stays like this. One day c5 could be an issue. Right now there's still d5. But hard to move anything. It's probably Maxi is trying to avoid a scenario like that. He's trying to figure out if he can solve his problems directly. 
by taking here that. Go to rook d1, rook c1. So rook here. Now, take this pawn. But he has to be careful. Leaving this guy alive. Compi says this is fine. It's equal. Maybe he's just trying to calculate one of these lines until the end to try to avoid drifting into a slightly passive situation after c takes d, the pawn to f5. All right. Back to Rapper Carlson, where after knight to g6, pawn to a5 was played, grabbing space on the queen side. Carlson decides to castle, which is more brazen than it looks like, because it does leave this pawn unprotected. And White had already announced that he might be interested in taking that pawn one day by putting his queen on d1. Rapper plays rook to a4. What's that about? Let's put the rook here. Battle for me. Question is, can black take now, or is this still asking for trouble? Takes, takes. Either bishop f4, pinning the knight, or queen takes h5, regaining the pawn. Both look sort of pleasant for white. I'm not sure how bad this is. But with this king... Would prefer white. Magnus, thinking about it. Before we get back to this, just very briefly, Maxime has decided after c takes d to go rook takes e4 indeed, d takes c3 and rook to e3, chasing down the pawn with his other rook, making sure this guy keeps guarding the back rank. Pawn to c2, rook to c3. And yeah, probably that was a good decision. Just eliminating all potential structural weaknesses with the pawn on d4. Exchanging everything. Oh, I guess. Aims a big favorite to end peacefully. Something like e5, takes, takes. Takes here. Look here, let's say. I think checkmate. But they will probably spot that after king f4. This position. Looks very, very equal. So I guess we're headed towards a draw there, more likely than not. I Means we can focus on the other games mainly. So we'll revisit the MVL Ding game should something exciting happen. I don't think it will in that one. So Magnus, weighing his options, He's questioning his opening choices, thinking, I could have a black pawn here on e5 at the chance of move number one. But now oh, there's his white pawn. He has to figure out how bad his position is if he takes it, or if he has any suitable alternatives. Knight c5 also looks logical. Hitting the rook. Yes. I was going to say, I guess rook b4, but then I started wondering if black can actually be greedy. Take this pawn. Computer says no. Computer says this is all great for white. That's not that obvious to me. Why? Pompey says, even pawn to g4. Whoa. So aggressive. And the white attack is very strong here. Maybe that was an idea. Rook to a4 as well to just prepare. Pawn to g4. Really going after the Black King. Carlson, ever so slightly, shaking his head. Doesn't look thrilled. And maybe he's also not thrilled about these types of positions if he takes the pawn. Not just because of queen takes h5, but after bishop to f4, pawn to f6, so let's say. By let's say, I mean exactly queen d4. He's sort of 
forced to defend as well with very few winning chances. I was wondering why not take the pawn now? But then black is in time to unpin with queen to d7. Sneaky little move. Hitting the rook on b4 and making sure the knight from e5 is allowed to move again after rook goes wherever. Say here. Now the knight can move and black at least is sort of active with his extra pawn in the center. Uh, yeah, Magnus Carlsen does not look overly happy about what he's done here so far. And slowly, 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 time is also running out. Well, running out is strong, but down to 11 minutes. So pace will pick up. What else is there? Knight c5 is no good. And taking the pawn is no good. Are there any other sensible moves? We could go knight c5, the rook goes somewhere, b4 or d4, I don't know. And then put a knight on e4 maybe. Also trying to block this g4 option. Pompey not in love with it, says White just goes bishop e3. Once again, gives White a sizable plus. Now, Black were to take here, and the rook could take the pawn. Black were to take this guy. Then there's apparently tactical issues. Too complicated. For me, bishop to b6. And if knight takes f3, then g takes f3. Well, if the queen goes away, white can take and use the pin. Okay, we're a bit far from the position on the board, but that's probably the kind of lines that Magnus is calculating. And he's reluctant to make a move, shaking his head a bit. Probably does not like the outcome of these lines and is looking for an alternative. What is there? It's not so much that white threatens anything directly. I mean, g4 could be a threat, but also that black is sort of out of logical moves if he decides not to take here. If he makes a move like rook to e8, white could even take sort of a timeout, go rook to b4, making sure that whenever this pawn gets taken, b7 is hanging. So it's not like that improves his position greatly. Therefore, Carlson some trouble here. Has been dominating the matchup against Rapport in Rapid and Blitz. I recall that game from, I think it was last year's, well, Blitz Championship, some crazy French, where Rapport was completely winning and then crumbled on the finish line. So Rapport has had good positions against Magnus, but has not had a great <coughs> success rate with lower time controls. He beat him in classical ones, I think in Vikamze. A couple of years back. In the rapid. What is it? 9-1 in Magnus' favor. However, could very well change in this game. Because Magnus Carlsen, the world number one, is under pressure. Seen some debate on Twitter recently if Magnus is playing enough classical chess to stay world number one. But that's how the rating system works, no? <laughs> and he will play in Norway chess, which is a classical tournament shortly. So yeah, his lack of appetite for too many classical wrong robins, I think he's fairly outspoken about. He mentioned himself, he's not sure he will ever, I think his words, Play in like a normal classical round robin like the ones they have in the Grand Chess Tour. Again, 
In Norway, it's sort of a hybrid format. They play these two-hour time controls with no increment and then the Armageddon game. But Magnus Carlsen clearly preferring the short time controls recently, which we can also see by the tournaments emerging, like this Grand Kid Chess Classic. Used to be a classical tournament, but now it's two rapid games per day, which I'm assuming, I don't know, also has something to do with Magnus's input and his preferences, as is this Chess 960 tournament we had earlier in the year. Carlson went rook c to e8. Sign something's gone a little wrong. He has to move this rook again. He doesn't look thrilled. He doesn't want to move this rook maybe to keep the option of pawn to f6 in the position. But if Rupper once again does his rook b4, it's a little rook shuffle here. What's white's next? What's black's next move? Doesn't look happy. Meanwhile, the Kaima Friedman clash has simplified somewhat. Friedman in this position went for a knight to d4. So the various pawn pushes I was fantasizing about just exchanges. His knight keeps a bit of an edge. But now the white king on e3 is less bothered with fewer pieces on the board. And after rook c7, exchanging a pair of rooks, it looks like the worst is over for Vincent Keimer. Because also, after pawn to f5, his tiny weakness, or Keimer's tiny weakness on e4, can be exchanged now for the black pawn on f5. So I guess. This should be headed towards a draw too. While our first game is officially over, the Maxim Vashila Grav Ding Lira encounter has ended peacefully. No big surprise there. Very solid outing for Ding Lira. Did not have any problems whatsoever. Went for this operation with knight to e4, exchanging a bunch of pieces early on. And it was MVL who had to be precise to keep the game in the balance. But he managed to do so by taking his time here, probably taking a good decision with this rook takes e4, so the standard c takes d, after which maybe he could have been slightly worse. But after rook takes e4, all material disappeared from the board fairly quickly. And yeah, this position, there's not much to play for it's this level, both sides. Find a way to exchange the remaining pawns on the queen side, and with three pawns against three, it will repetition and a draw is on the board. In the Kaima Friedman game, I think it draws also the most likely. You still slightly prefer black, maybe, with the bishop against the knight, but it does not look decisive. This time peacefully as well. But for now, let's concentrate on the most complicated position, Richard Rapport against Magnus Carlsen. Rook to d4 was played, no rook to b4. And Carlsen takes the pawn on e5. Just pausing because I'm wondering why he couldn't take this one now, but maybe just thought it's too risky after potential attacks here like pawn to g4. So knight takes e5, knight takes e5, knight takes e5. Once again, white has a choice, which we were talking about. Queen, Queen takes h5 and bishop to f4 first, pinning. That's what Rapper will be thinking about. Queen takes h5. I guess Carlson plays f6. No, just as I say, I guess he plays this. Computer says, no, 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 sir. This would be a big blunder. The reason is bishop takes f6 works. And now this happened, by the way, play bishop f4, so I'll just show him very briefly. Bishop takes f6, gf, because if the rook were to take, this would be a hanging. gf and rook takes e5, 
f takes e, rook g4. Why would win the queen? And then his remaining queen and the couple of pawns would be crushing the black two rooks. So this didn't happen. Instead, Rapper started with bishop to f4, pinning the knight, pawn to f6, and queen takes h5. But this gives Carlson a chance to play queen f7, no? Once again, unpinning with a little trick. And if queen takes, he can play knight takes, keeping his material. And it looks like the worst is over. Yeah, queen f7 played. Couldn't wait for white to take on e5, grabbing a pawn. I think now he can maybe take a breath of relief. Doesn't look too bad. The white queen goes away. This knight can go to c6. Well, the end game, the queens get exchanged. Queen takes, knight takes. Like threatening e5. Why would I have to lose the tempo? I'm not going somewhere with this rook. And looks like black should be more or less all right. So I don't know if Rapper missed queen f7. Or if he just thought this was the safest course of action. And he's very fine even after exchanging queens. But looks like he missed a bit of a chance here. Starting with this queen takes h5. Based on this... Very cunning tactic, f6, bishop takes f6, which is also easier spotted if the computer shows you. So for now, it looks like we'll have two draws, and then still all to play for in Rapport Carlson, although that position has just calmed down quite a bit as well with the exchange of queens. Should Rapport up for it. Thinking about it, alternative he has it also looks like it's mainly simplifying would be to play queen to e2, sort of hitting this knight, only sort of because he's not really threatening to take it twice because this would be hanging. But if the knight were to move, white could go bishop d6, takes, takes, and he will regain his exchange. By taking here, this rook has nowhere to go. Yes, this is sort of a way to make the position less exciting as well. White plays something. Queen here takes, takes. Once again, we should have rough equality. So, rapper with a big decision here exchange queens or not. Carlson, yeah, he's leaning back, back a bit, he knows, I think. He might have dodged a bit of a bullet there. Escaped. A tricky spot. But sort of good at chess, that young Norwegian. So probably we can't call him luck. Keeps happening to him. In Kama Friedman, more exchanges are imminent. Kama play Rook D2. It's calculated that rook e7 is not too big a threat because after rook d4, he keeps his peace and next order of business would be to move the king away. Looks fairly equal. Friedman could, of course, also exchange rooks. But no, he does go rook e7. Rook d4 will be played. Looks like black doesn't have enough firepower. To ask more questions here. To play g5, stopping king to f4, but the king can also go to f3. This just looks equal. I guess I'm always uncertain with all these pawn end games. I guess they're all drawn, but you don't want to find out with black and go for something where all of a sudden it's the white king that is more active. So I would be surprised. If Friedman elected to exchange everything here, but if he wants a draw, he can of course take and play whatever. Rook c7. White does not have any winning chances with her rooks remaining on the board. But it does look like he doesn't have enough to keep playing for an advantage. Vincent Keimer 
bit of a time trouble addict. Down to less than one minute. Not the end of the world. In this position. That's something to keep an eye on. In the rest of the tournament. Then again, he's had tremendous results in rapid. Even though he's usually very, very low on time. Here, doesn't really matter. Position is simplified enough. Yet, he won't have any, any issues. Coasting to security. Meanwhile, sorry for yelling. Rapport has exchanged queens. Queen takes, knight takes. And gone away with the bishop. I'm wondering a bit, is this the typical script? How you lose to Magnus, you put pressure, but he defends then sort of equal. Not the only way to lose to Magnus, as I'm very aware. Um, then he sli slowly starts shuffling his piece around. In the end game, asking questions. Rapport is not worse here, but it feels like this has gone Magnus's way over the last couple of moves. Oh, sorry. I thought the I saw the camera was staying with the Germans, but might as well stay here. And I'll let you know once the Keimer Friedman game ends peacefully. I'd be shocked if anything else happened there. However, just as I said it, I see Friedman decides not to exchange the bishop for the knight, keeps some play. So let's see. I was leaning in. He does look happier than a couple moves ago. Found a white pawn to play with. Studying the position. To decide on a plan. Could try to improve his knight. Try to bring the king into action. Not how much it does. King h7, King g6. I think these are the options. The pawns can't move or shouldn't move. The rooks are still busy covering the pawns. So it looks like knight to d8, tending knight to c6. Or king to h7. As also knight to h6 and knight to f5. Not sure you guys. Spot the position there, but not an F7. It's not misplaced, but it has to do something to help Black's coordination. So here or here, or here and then here. Look like decent starts. Well, Compi actually favors King to H7. Trump is good at chess. And his rook to b4. And now it goes knight to d8. Then it wants to go rook f7, knight c6. Not sure why we need king h7 for that. What's the issue with knight d8? Ah, then, ah, of course. Then there's bishop to d6. And if rook f7, rook takes d5. That's the problem. And we can't recapture because the rook would be on place. So knight d8, my favorite move, would actually hang a pawn. And Carlson, also good at chess, goes king to h7. Was it advocated for by the computer? Yeah, still sort of empty. But what should Rapport do? I'd be tempted to play c4. Change the structure. Drawback is then black can take. It doesn't have to worry about the d5 pawn anymore. So he could go e5. To keep this bishop at bay. Oh yeah, white. White shouldn't be worse here. 
try to activate it again, exchange some pawns if needed. But it feels like, or maybe it's the Magnus factor, but it feels like Rapport should now go to making sure he doesn't <laughs> end up in trouble here. The time for putting pressure seems to have passed. Could be wrong, and Rapport, of course, is a tremendous endgame player. But I think that's the best position, Castles, in a long, long time. We have another result. The Kaimo Friedman game has ended in a draw as well. Yeah, it wasn't that much left to play for. And the players, as often in these situations, found a move repetition. King f2, rook f7, king e3. And rook back and forth. Another draw. I guess both sides can be sort of happy with the outcome. I'm sure Vincent had bigger plans, but with this position he got out of the opening, the draw was really the best he could hope for while dying at Friedman. Nominally, the lowest rated player in this star-sided field. Starts with a <coughs> sorry, black draw from the position of strength. Getting his feet wet. So that leaves us with just the Richard Rapport versus Magnus Carlsen game. Magnus has to provide the entertainment here in round one already. Pawn to g4 played by Rapport, who sees no reason to be chicken like me, trying to simplify and exchange things. Just grab space. Now good old knight to d8 is possible. The difference would be, maybe that's the point of king h7 as well. But now I can keep his rook here, square vacated by the king, and thus making sure that rook takes d5, e takes d5. Is now impossible from White's perspective because his book is discovered and the knight could end up on this nice square on c6. And yeah, knight d8 was played indeed. Bishop to d6. The rook has to go. Here? Here? I do not know. Maybe there's not a big difference. Maybe actually to h8, just, you know, case you ever want to do. Surprise, sneak attack on the h4 point. But no, he goes on g8. Next order of business. Would be knight to c6. Not sure if white can try to stop that with rook to b4. Yeah, rook to b4 played. Knight c6 is still possible. Then white would take on b7. Not sure. What is this? Still equal? Yeah, knight c6 played. Knight takes a5. Yeah, this is all on the board. Rook should go somewhere. Who's better and why? Peter says equality. I like that with the rook on the seventh after knight c4, we have this little move hitting the f6 pawn. Black also has his own tricks, like knight to e5, threatening this fork, and attacking this guy. This is surprisingly sharp, actually. So maybe I should shut up. Also, my voice is leaving me already. On one, and just see what they do. Magnus seen a ghost. <clears throat> if you're wondering if we'll have the players on the show, by the way, I guess. Since there's only a 15-minute break after this first round, 
they will use the time to grab a bite to eat and maybe prepare a bit for their next round game. But after the second round, there are no more excuses. And we hope to have some of these chess stars joining us here, explaining their thoughts, their wishes, their evening plans. So, probably not right now, but after the next round. Try to get at least some of them. Studio's long, long walk from the playing hall by long, long time. Five minutes, but someone would have to show them the way. But hopefully we'll get it. It's under the same roof. It's a big roof. Hmm. Magnus looks like something's bothering him, but it's more this look like. Uh, I'm annoyed I missed some detail, not this look. Oh, I'm in real big trouble. I think he knows. The worst is over. Well, Rapport is trying to decide where to put his rook. Probably deciding between the a7 and c7 square. Keep it on the seventh rank. Alsen's down to 1 minute 39 seconds. Does get the 10 seconds per move. And these guys, in particular, of course, Magnus, can play amazing chess with just the increment, but he doesn't have a lot of time to keep calculating. Rapport still has a little more than 7 minutes, so he can afford. Take a bit of a time out here. Try to figure out what's going on. Richard Rapport became a bit of a rock star last year when he was helping Ding Liren during the World Championship match against Jan Nepomnesi. And all these stories would emerge how the two of them would listen to Bob Dylan's songs and try to decide if the French would be a good opening surprise for Jan upon the sheet. Yeah, I think Rafa gained a lot of fans there. Also, with the pictures from on site where they would embrace after Ding had a good result. Ding did become the world champion, so team rapper Ding in action here again, although not on the same team. Come on, Richie. Let's move the rook. C7, D7, A7. Pick a square. Not sure that's how it works. I guess all the lines could be similar, actually. If he were to choose this square, and yeah, he does. I was going to say, that has the advantage that now there's no rook to d8 <clears throat> challenging the rook. Well, if the rook were to go to a7, that would have rook a8 asking it a question. But there are other drawbacks, like knight e5 now comes with the tempo. So all have pros and cons. And Rapport after knight c4 decides to play pawn to b3, hoping, I guess, for this exchange when he would have a double attack. Although this looks George as well, by a double attack against these two pawns. But Carlsen goes for a knight to d2, more aggressive, with his own little double attack, hitting the pawn on b3 and threatening knight of 3 check. Rapport can't allow that, so we'll have to go, let's say, king g2. And Carlsen could pick up a pawn. Why is this counterplay with his bishop e7 attacking this guy? Looks like. There is some action. Did Rapport miss 92? Does he look upset? Or is this part of the plan? Calculating. Hard to say. 
He's upset. Goes rook to e2. Similar idea, sidestepping the fork. But allowing Carlson to take the pawn. Maybe rook b2 features in his plans as well to activate the rook, but it's not, not doing all that much. Hmm. Carlson taking a moment. Does he have an alternative? I try to go after this pawn. Weapons here. Check. King g2 takes. King g3. Knight g6. Takes a pawn, but white will become very active. For example, f4, where I threaten rook h2. Almost checkmate. So maybe that's a little risky. But food for thought for Magnus. Doesn't have a lot of time for thought. Down to 30 seconds. Let's see. Yeah, he does go take pawn on b3. Correctly. Not going after the h4 pawn. Back to Rapport. Plays bishop b7. Very logical as well. Threatening bishop takes f6 because of this pin. And also, maybe not threatening, but hinting at rook takes e6. Saying not threatening because then knight c5. Say here. Could be an issue. But I guess my example doesn't work because in this position actually hurts. <laughs> This very cute checkmate. But after another move, then king h8. That could work. That's why Carlson goes king to h6. Now after rook takes e6, there is knight c5. Rapport, pawn down. It's to find a way to keep the initiative going. Which one is it? g5 check. Just a quiet move. King g2. Pawn to f4. Point is you can't take now, because now knight to c5 does attack both rooks. And this trick I showed earlier doesn't work with the king on h6. Rook d5, knight e6, rook h5. Now there's king g6. So black will win in exchange. And again, Magnus has found a way to ask questions. He's not better, according to Compi, but he's a pawn up, and Rapport has to solve problems. The way computer wants to play this is not exactly intuitive, say king h2. Not the first move that comes to mind. First move that comes to mind is rook e6, that doesn't work. Then you start thinking about rook b2, I guess, hitting the knight. But the knight, yes. Plenty of jumps available. Or black could even go rook b8. That e6 is no longer hanging. So this isn't over. Is Magnus going to work his magic here? Only has 19 seconds. Goes king to f1. What's that about? On to e5 plate. Making sure he doesn't have to worry about this anymore. Rook takes d5 doesn't work yet because the rook takes e7. Rapper now plays rook to b2. And the knight goes away. Bunch of moves coming in. Looks like black is still white is still active enough to keep the balance with rook b6. Hitting this pawn and also threatening g5 check. And probably that's why he played king f1 very deep. To be out of the g file if he ever needs to open it with g5 and g takes f6. Knight goes to c4. Yes, you take the pawn. Yep. 
pawn gets taken. Also might want to sidestep this g5 check now. He has a very pretty knight, but white has some activity. She takes f6 or g5 check looming. d5 pawn, not currently under attack, but also um, potential target. Carlson goes rook a8, tries to simplify. Not afraid of g5, because after king g6, he would still be threatening to exchange rooks. Therefore, white wouldn't have time to take here. But Rapport can now take here and then grab the d5 pawn. It would be white being a pawn up instead of black, as we've seen a few moves ago. Magnus has not missed this. He's probably just judged that with his rook active and his knight active, he's not in trouble here. Let's see. If Rapport goes for this, or if he tries to keep playing for the attack, he could move his rook to e6. Renewing the threat of g5 check. Rapport's time is also getting lower and lower, down to two minutes now. Decision. Just take. Hmm. Safer choice. Not in the mood for more adventures after book T6. Carlson is a pawn down, but his position looks fairly healthy. If he goes rook here. But what's going on? Oh, no, no. Ah, it was the computer. <laughs> computer. Tried to move the rook from A8 all the way to A2, but got stuck on A3 there for a second. Not what happened. Do you guys see it? Was a computer error, right? White should not go king g2. Might be three. Would be slightly unpleasant fork. That goes bishop c5, covering the f2 pawn. I guess I could try to restore the material balance with rook c2, but yeah, rook c2 played. But then white has some active options of his own. Ah, he doesn't do that, he goes rook d3. He had the option to go rook d7, tending to play bishop f8, going after this pawn. Knight d2 check, blunder! White can take. Ooh, Magnus Carlsen hangs a piece, 92, and Rapport immediately realizes what he's done. Rook takes d2, and after Rook takes d2, there's Bishop e3 check with a double attack. Magnus not please loses this game, which was a very complicated game, by hanging a piece of rare oversight for the number one in the world in this position after rook to d3. If he plays, um, yeah, he quote unquote normal move, like pawn to e4, promptly says rook d4, and rook takes c3. The game should end peacefully. Or just king h7, preparing knight d2 if needed, stepping out of this diagonal. Position would be equal, but Carlson goes for knight d2 check. And Rapport does not hesitate, takes immediately, and Black has to resign. Because after Rook takes d2, Bishop e3. Picks up the Rook, White emerges, peace up. Shocking blunder by Magnus Carlsen, the big favorite here. And it's Richard Rapport, who 
draws first blood in this tournament, wins his game against Magnus, and thereby, of course, takes the lead because the other two games ended peacefully, as we've seen earlier. Keimer Friedman was a hard fight where Friedman had the advantage of the opening. Keimer defended nicely. Similar story, sort of, in MVL against Ding Liren, although I'm not sure MVL was ever worse, but Ding Liren easily neutralized MVL's London system and made a draw without any problems. So Rapport Carlson, big fight in the Karakan, where Rapport got the advantage of the opening, seemed well prepared. Then Carlson did his Carlson magic, got a very playable, complicated endgame. Then, shockingly, with very little time on the clock, he hung a night and lost the game. He's sometimes a slow starter, Magnus Carlson, but he won't be pleased. We will be back in around 15 minutes, probably we'll be back. A bit before that with round number two, which is Ding Liren versus Richard Rapport. Daniel Friedman, the qualifier against Magnus Carlsen and Vincent Keimer against Maxime Vashila Graf. The action will be fast paced here. It's a fun little format. We'll take a breather. Thank you so much for watching. Sorry, you have to bear with just me. But our dear friend, Mr. Leko, is recovering. And his voice is even more gone than mine, I'm told. We hope to see him one of these days. Thanks for watching. See you with round number two. Until then. I grew up in the small fortress town of Woerden. I've lived here all my life. When I was five, my father taught me the game, and soon thereafter took me to the local chess club. I can't really remember my life without chess. I feel like it's always been there. I met my wife through chess. Uh, my profession is chess. I don't play chess to win. I'm not that competitive. Uh, I love how the pieces move, I love the game. I love how everything around me becomes still. When I'm behind the chessboard, time doesn't flow the same way. Until the clock runs out. In the spring of 2021, time seemed to have run out. I was diagnosed with Hodgkinson's disease, which is a form of cancer. I was 35 and suddenly my life changed. It was a strange time and chess didn't seem to matter at all. But I was optimistic. I uh, trusted the treatment plan and the doctors that were helping me. And uh, I felt it was in their hands now. The chemotherapy, radiation, uh, at the worst I could barely walk around the block that it really puts things in perspective <laughs> like like uh, if I have a bad position now yeah I mean, it's, really, it's, it's no big deal uh, you know so maybe in that sense it helps that that you have a more of a, a different kind of attitude to 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 the life There are definitely also positive things I take from that time when I was not uh, well. Um, I think it gives you kind of different perspective on life, on, on, on everything actually. So it's, uh, it was definitely not only um, negative. It takes a long time to recover, but chess players are anything if not patient. It, it was crazy because one month before the tournament in Vegas, I still had my radiation therapy finished. So it was, it was way too early actually to, to start playing, but I, I wanted to desperately be at that tournament. I barely prepared for the games because I, I was just too tired. I, just, I only played the games, I had dinner, went back to my room, slept most of the time. I had put that tournament as, an, um, as a goal. Best tournament I ever played. 
Then at the end of the year, after um, 16 field attempts, I uh, became Dutch champion. And that was really the cherry on, on the cake. That was huge for me. I was ecstatic. It was the feeling of I'm back. All those failures, all those setbacks, they um, never seem to matter now. What is important is that uh, I have a lot of chess ahead of me. I always wait for the moment when uh, I wake up and I realize that I, well, today I don't really feel like looking at chess, but it just never happens. My name is Erwin Lamy and I'm a Dutch Grandmaster. We have Magnus Carlsen's most incredible moments as world champion. This one right here is Vishwanathan Anand with the white pieces versus Magnus Carlsen in 2013. Here we go. So this is a Nimzo Indian, same as variation, right? And the last move here was B3 from Magnus, just saying, hey man, I'm trying to queen this pawn. And of course, Anand is saying, I'm trying to mate your king. Cool, you can get your little queen. I'm just gonna try to checkmate you, right? So of course, this is a hints to move uh, F5, B3. And he's like, cool. Well, Vishwanathan Anand says, hey, okay, you can get this queen. I'm gonna try to go for mate. So he goes queen F4, get another piece in the game. This looks very, very dangerous here. Knight C7, what the heck is going on? Knight to C7, he thought it'd be something spectacular. He was like, yeah, I'm waiting for this one. But it's just knight to c7. Defensive move. Cool. Allows f6 to happen here. f6 is going to take on g7. It's going to be kind of annoying, scary things happening with knight h5. Magnus plays g6. Okay, it's locked up. It's going to be scary if a queen gets to h6. Also, if the queen and a rook get to the h file, it's going to be a wrap for black here. Magnus is going to be mated. Okay, cool. So Magnus understands that. Vichy Anand understands that too. And plays queen to h4. Where is he going, class? h6 right he's about to mate. he's also trying to get the rook over here too as well okay cool with that being said your move what do you do now it's black to move here's the move hence knight c7 to put the knight on e8 the saying goes a knight on e8 is actually f8 the x is what they say there is no mate Anand understands this he said oh there's no more mate that's cool uh -ha -ha. i'm gonna put my queen right here uh, ha, ha. What I'm trying to do is bring the rook up to f3 or f4 and actually go for this mate on h7 because you stopped the g7 mate. That's cool. Perfect. Well, Magnus understands this. So what does Magnus do in this position? Black to move. Here it is. Magnus says, cool. You want mate? Okay, that's cool. That's cool. Go for it. B2. Do your thing, big fella. Go ahead, Vishwanathan Anand. So he says, okay, I will, young fella. Rook f4. He goes here and he's going for rook h4 mate. Wow. This is scary. Why well, are you going to get your queen? You did all of this. Are you going to get your queen or not? Of course we are. B1 queen. Right. And after B1 queen, knight to f1 from Anand. And the move, the move here that seals the deal is what, guys? There's two queens on the board. Magnus has two queens. But is he getting mated or not? It's black to move. He goes queen e1, and then the game is over. <laughs> the game ended right here, believe it or not. There is no more PGN, right? What do you mean, queen e1? How, what, what? What What sense does that make? Well, let's see what happens. The, the idea here, you have to queen e1. Where were you putting your rook? h4. Well, I can just go rook h4, but guess what? After I capture it, queen sacrifice, sacrificing one of my two queens, after queen takes h4, let's do a peace count. You have a queen, you have a bishop, and a knight. I have a queen, a bishop, a knight, and a rook, guys. So after that, this is done, right? I have an extra piece, an extra rook, and there's no mate here. So that's a resignation. And Magnus wins. That's incredible, right? Ever since the chess engine Deep Blue defeated world champion Garry Kasparov in 1997, computers have been better at chess than even the best humans. Today, the margin isn't even close. Top engines play near-perfect chess, and playing against them is basically futile. But every now and again, there's a chess puzzle that stumps the engines, and us humans can solve it faster. Let's take a look at our first puzzle. 
So when we initially look here, uh, the engine, as you can see, still thinks it's a draw, um, but if left for long enough, eventually it might find the mate in eight sequence. So let's look at the first most intuitive sacrifice, maybe bishop f7, but then after the king takes back, queen follows up with queen h5, king g7, there's no real follow-up. There's no continued attack for white. So if we go back to the initial position, let's try that, well, I already gave it away. Let's try that in a different move order where instead of the bishop coming in first, we sacrifice the queen. As humans, of course, we love to sacrifice our queen. It just feels so good. And the king takes, and now we do the bishop check, and you'll see that this critical g6 square is cut off. So the best try for black is to go down here to king h8, and then we have a very quiet but deadly move. So we can bring in knight d2. Not attacking right away, but it's preparing knight f3, which, as you can see, would lead to checkmate. What black can do is try to delay this maybe by pinning. We can just push here, takes, takes, and now black can only delay the inevitable. They can try f4 here to try to give themselves an escape square, but we just go knight f3 all the same, king g4, and now we have the piece de resistance, a quiet, subtle e4. Now they have no more moves. No matter what black plays, we have checkmate on the next move. Ooh, how satisfying is that? One pawn, five suspects. Bring your deductive skills to the chessboard this March and help solve the mystery. Was it the movie star, Tina Tempo? The heiress, Beatrice Bishop? The Green Pawns coach, Remy Rook. Tournament organizer, Madame Mate, perhaps? Or the arbiter, Professor Passant? Play them all, gather the clues, and find out who done it on chess.com. Looking for new ways to enjoy chess? Check out our schedule of chess.com community events today. Mondays, play rapid opening roulette and expand your opening repertoire with a new opening each month. Tuesdays, compete against other untitled players in Untitled Tuesday. Battle your way to the top in Arena Kings on Wednesdays. Join the crazy fun of the Variance Community Series each Thursday. And finish the week off each Saturday with the blistering Community Bullet Brawl. All happening in the Community Club on Chess.com.
Welcome back everybody, round number two of the Grand Chess Classic 2024 is just kicking off after the shock finish to the first round where Magnus Carlsen plundered a piece and lost to Richard Rapport. Carlsen now has the black pieces against the lowest rated player in the field, the qualifier Daniel Friedman and Magnus will be looking for blood to get back in the tournament. But easier said than done, Daniel, a very, very solid player with the white pieces, went for pawn to d4, knight to f6, and knight to f3. Carlsen is trying to maybe mix a little bit by pawn to b6, but that's not really so much out there. White could just play pawn to c4 when the game would most likely transpose to sort of a Queen's Indian setup. But we've seen Carlsen dabble with things like the double fianchetto particular when he's looking for a fight, trying to keep pieces on the board and things complicated. And Friedman is weighing his options here. If he wants to play pawn to c4 or if he wants to play a move like pawn to g3, also very solid, anticipating Black's Fianchetto, putting his bishop on g2, then castle. We'll see which way the game goes, but it does look like Carlsen is not trying to equalize here, but instead to create as tense a situation as possible. So that's, I guess, the main game we'll keep an eye on. But we also have Vincent Keimer, once again with the white pieces, did not get much out of the opening in the first game against Friedman. And this time around, he is playing Maxim Vachela Graf, who has recently changed his opening repertoire. He used to be a big fan of the Grunfeld defense with knight f6 and pawn to g6. But recently he started playing the Queen's Gambit accepted here with c4, d takes c4, which is a very tough opening to meet. If you're not well prepared, let's see what Vincent has up his sleeve. Vincent, known for his many opening trees in German chess circles. Let's see if he's built a good tree here. Bishop b4 check, bishop d2. This is still mainline theory. Bishop takes, knight takes. Um, white is temporarily sacrificing a pawn on d4, but he is ahead in development. We can see his three minor pieces are already out. And <clears throat> the theory debate continues. Knight to c6. Short castles is normal here. Black then typically plays bishop to e6. And then white has a choice. Oh, hang on, I'm mixing everything up. Then white has a choice how to proceed. But in this move order, after short castles, why am I confused? Here, ah, this is not the position where you play bishop e6. Because now, after takes, takes. Black apparently is not in time. And white gains a big advantage by a move like queen to b3, targeting this pawn and this pawn. The line I was thinking of is knight to f3, knight to c6, bishop takes c4. E takes D, short castles, and here you play bishop E6. But this doesn't work so well once the bishops are already exchanged. Hmm. So, let's see how this develops. Bishop B4 check, bishop to D2. I guess bishop D2 is a bit of a sideline here. The main theoretical debates have been centered around knight to c3. And here there's this very sharp line that Maxime has been playing regularly with knight to f6, knight takes c5, and pawn to b5. But Vincent doesn't want any piece of that. He goes for bishop to d2, which is a calmer alternative. Bishop takes and knight takes. It's also slightly rare. I've seen some games like Giri versus Abdusatorov, where queen takes d2 was played, so that white can recapture here with the knight or with the queen. But Keimer has done some homework, and he goes for knight b takes d2, e takes d, bishop takes c4. Bishop takes c4, knight c6. But now he's thinking, so not clear how much homework has been done. I'm out of book. I've never looked at this bishop d2, knight bd2 much. So I'm trying to figure out what's going on here. I think 
queen f6 some old line knight g e7 i only vaguely recall some old games here so slightly uncharted territory for me it looks like vincent is also taking his time here and not that sure what to do and he has castled let's see if mvl keeps blitzing out his moves or if they're both on their own but i would guess not maxim has worked a lot on this queen's gambit accepted and is probably prepared for such sidelines as well okay let's conclude our tour through the games go to the encounter between the classical world champion ding liren and our tournament leader richard rapport this is a special game because these two are friends richard rapport the main help helper for Ding Liren during his World Championship match. So they've looked at lots of openings together. And that's always a special situation if you play against a second a trainer because you've debated all kinds of things and typically the players will choose something that hasn't been a priority in their work together. Ding goes for pawn to g3, inviting Rapport to play the Catalan opening after pawn to d5. But Rapport says, no, thank you. Let's spice it up. And he goes c5, after which we have a so-called Benoni structure, where white is committed to pawn to g3. But this is a much riskier approach for black. Rapport feeling good after winning his first game against Magnus Kals. All of this, I guess, is theory. Rook to e8, rook to e1, pawn to a6, pawn to a4, knight b to d7, and the bishop goes to f4. Hitting the pawn on d6. Memory serves. There are some other lines here. Pawn to h3, pawn to e4. But bishop f4 plate. Rapport quickly goes queen to c7. Covering the pawn. Now Ding has to decide what to do. Pawn to e4 looks very logical after he's already played. Rook to e1. But sometimes they want to start with pawn to h3 in such positions. The reason being that if you start with the e4, black has this jump knight to g4, trying to fight for the dark squares in the center, ASAP. Therefore, Ding is taking a pause here, considering probably pawn to h3, maybe or some other moves like rook to c1. The problem is white usually doesn't manage to play both h3 and e4, because if he goes h3, then a typical counter would be to play knight to e4. I think, correct me if I'm wrong, my knowledge of this is very rusty, but I think I've seen something like knight d2, and then black sometimes sacrifices the exchange with rook takes f4, bishop takes b2. He wouldn't be forced to, he could also go rook b4 with a very non standard situation already. But Ding is probably also searching his memory bank for if there's anything stored above these Benoni positions. So this has the makings of a sharp fight. In Friedman Carlson, we've also seen a lot of moves being made quickly. Friedman did indeed play g3, Fianchetto his bishop. And Carlson also, no surprise, goes for the double Fianchetto trying to keep all pieces on the board. He's had some success with this approach. He defeated Arjun Erigaisi in a sharp game here. And Daniel not backing down, plays a principal move, pawn to d5, cutting this bishop off. Might look more natural to develop a knight here with knight to c3, but then black can play knight to e4, and solving most of his problems, activating both bishops and stopping white from grabbing too much space in the center. So typically, white tries to avoid that and either plays sort of a waiting move here like rook to e1 or the more ambitious move that is played by Friedman, pawn to d5. Inviting Carlsen to spice it up because black could play pawn to b5 here, so which things would get messy. But Carlsen decides not to do that and instead to develop pieces with knight to a6, knight to c3. Now this knight jump has been stopped as the bishop no longer controls the square. So Carlsen said, brings the other knight, knight to c5, knight to d4. Not sure if 
that's the only move by once again stopping anything from appearing on the e4 square and Carlsen goes pawn to e5 transposing into sort of a king's indian structure white could take en passant here but this bishop is defended by the knight so he wouldn't achieve very much black would just recapture with a sound position therefore instead friedman plays knight to b3 once they exchange knights and maybe pronounce that this bishop is a bit misplaced against this pawn chain but Carlsen gets his fighting structure that he was looking for pawn to d6 knight takes c5 b takes c5 now Friedman will try to undermine this queen side plays pawn to a3 intending pawn to b4 create some action here and Carlsen will typically look to counter on the queen side with moves like pawn to f5 Pawn to e4 if he's allowed. He goes knight to d7. Freeman plays pawn to e4. Stopping black from grabbing too much space there. And Carlsen goes for the typical King's Indian counterplay move with pawn to f5. Pawn to b4 played. Expanding in the center and on the queen side. It looks like Friedman has a fairly comfortable position. With this bishop being catoed here. The quote unquote typical <coughs> black counterattack you often see in King's Indian structures with f4, g5, g4, doesn't really do that much damage. This bishop could sidestep to h3 here, control this crucial diagonal. Therefore, yeah, it's unlikely black would have enough time to start a mating attack. I would guess Carlson has to look for other ways to treat this position. Maybe. I don't know actually. Pawn to a5, is that a move to make white take here and then recapture with the knight? Another typical idea, but I'm not sure how well it works here, would be to take and play pawn to a5. That's a pawn sacrifice and I'm not sure. Black gets enough for it. My hunch would be no. Because white is still very stable and would have this extra pawn. Yeah, computer says this is just nonsense. So Carlson has to find a way to mix it here. Daniel so far looking good, playing quickly, confidently. Carlsen also blitzed out the first couple moves. But how does he proceed? Another way to play would be just to reshuffle this bishop back to c8, because the bishop is not doing very much on the b7 square. But the follow-up would still be unclear. Well, white has plenty useful moves. Rook to b1, bishop to d2. Maybe one day knight to a4 to put pressure on this construction. So Magnus Carlsen taking risks here, trying to get a sharp game against Daniel Friedman. But Daniel, so far, looking quite comfortable. And Carlsen plays bishop to a6. Hitting the pawn on c4 and trying to provoke Friedman to play b5, after which there would be no more tension on the queen side and black could then start his own plans on the other side of the board. But I guess white will not do him this favor and instead cover the c4 pawn with the queen. Not sure which square, d3 or e2. To keep some more options on the queen side. Cunning little move, this bishop a6. Let's see how Friedman reacts. Queen does move. It goes to d3 indeed. Covering the pawn. And once again. The ball is back. In Carlson's court. I could admit <coughs> bishop a6 didn't do much. Bring the bishop back to this diagonal. Or he could switch to play on the king's side now with pawn here. He could also insist on provoking pawn to b5 with knight to b6. But the problem is Friedman is still not forced to do it. He could go knight to b5, after which b takes c5 would be annoying because this knight no longer covers the square. And it's unclear if black achieved anything over there. 
Defo so far, looks like Friedman's doing well here. But of course, Magnus was not trying to win this game out of the opening, but create a tense situation. Maybe we'll just go F4 and hope for the best. Taking his time here. Other news in the Keimer MVL game. MVL Sivashila Graf has played knight g to e7. As I said, not an expert on this line. Queen f6, maybe even knight f6 look like alternatives. But knight g7, also very logical, making sure this knight doesn't get hit by pawn to e5. As Kaimer has to decide what to do next. The solid choice, because he's currently a pawn down, would be to play knight b3, which appears to be regaining this pawn. Because black cannot go bishop g4, trying to keep it, because then there's this little trick. First of all, you could still take, but more importantly, there's this typical little trick of bishop takes f7, king takes f7, and knight g5, with a discovered check, then picking up the bishop with a good position. So after knight b3, black should just finish development, go for short castles. White would recapture the pawn, takes, 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 and it doesn't look like black is too much trouble here. Position looks roughly. That's the sole option Keimer has. More aggressive choice would be knight to g5, targeting this pawn. Hoping for short castles, which would not happen, because then all of a sudden White would ask a lot of questions with Queen to H5. So instead of the knight to G5, Black should go knight to E5, covering the pawn, hitting the bishop, and play could get very sharp after bishop to B3, hinting at pawn to F4, let's say pawn to H6. Pawn to f4. And this could, could become very messy. Takes, takes. Attacking the pawn. But that looked like Vincent Keimer is freestyling here. So he has to calculate all this. While his opponent is most likely in book. That's not the most pleasant of situations. When you're trying to decide if you want to go for a very sharp line. Like knight to g5. So my best guess would be that Vincent plays it solid here, with knight to b3. The drawback being wouldn't give him much of an advantage. With that, we continue our little tour in Dingville's rapport after queen c7. Ding did indeed play h3. Very tough for me to pronounce h3. I'm German. Go easy on me. Stopping knight to g4. Rapport goes rook to b8. Hints at pawn to b5. There's Magnus checking out the game. And pawn to e4. Now knight to h5. I guess b5 was too slow because then white could break through in the center with pawn to e5. Let's say d takes c. Pawn to d6. This does not look great for black. So he had to take its time out, cover the e5 square. Goes knight h5, also hitting this bishop, which should move somewhere. You don't want to allow knight takes f4 here. So I'm not sure where it goes. Let's say d2. Now black could play b5. But white keeps having some trumps, even if black achieves that. Bishop f1 hitting this construction. It's unclear if black is so happy with the overall situation. I think, usual disclaimer, not an expert, blah, blah, blah. And rook to b8, intending b5 is sort of a rare plan. I mentioned earlier, knight to e4, I believe is the more typical way to handle these positions. 
pray the Bishop on tree seven. That rapport likes to go his own way. All right, back to Friedman Carlson. The bishop has indeed abandoned its mission on the queen side after bishop a6 trying to provoke b5. Friedman says, no, thank you. Goes queen to d3, covers the pawn. And Carl says, okay, just checking. I will go back to c8. Not clear if the queen is worse on d3 than on d1. My best guess would be no. But the bishop didn't have much to do on a6 anymore. So he goes back and Friedman tries to clarify the situation somewhat by going knight to a4, putting pressure on the c5 pawn, asking black if he's happy to allow b takes c5 and then to play with these double pawns. Black does not want to take here because after c takes b, a takes b, white gets a very nice structure for these positions and is ready to follow up with c5 whenever he sees fit. Instead, Magnus plays knight to f6, saying, you do your stuff on the queen side. I'll focus on the other side. And that's a good counter, because b takes c5. Something takes on e4, I guess, knight. Knight takes e4. And a bishop takes, f takes, queen takes e4. White would have won a pawn, but he would have weakened his king. Black would get a lot of activity. Bishop f5, queen e2, say pawn to e4. Both bishops all of a sudden are kicking. I don't think Daniel, who's been playing solidly, will want that. And indeed, he plays pawn to f3. Trying to maintain a structure here in the middle of the board. Once again, asking Carlson how he plans to deal with this. Carlson could play bishop d7, which I guess is logical. To hit the knight on a4. The knight would return, and the question how to deal with b takes c5 would remain. So Friedman's still doing well. But it does look like the camera's committed to Rapport versus Ding. So let's go there. Bishop back to e3 after knight to h5. Ah, no, it's leaving. And Rapport will once again contemplate pushing with pawn to b5. Could become very sharp after takes, takes. Now with the bishop on e3, the drawback is the rook is not covering the e4 square. So after bishop to f1, which looks logical to attack this pawn, black could grab a pawn in the center with bishop takes c3, b takes c, and rook takes e4. Would cost him his precious fianchetto bishop on g7. So it's not clear this is a good deal for black. But it does look like a logical play from both sides could lead to a very tense situation. We will see if Rapport is ready to enter it. But having, having played rook b8, b5, looks like a very logical follow-up. Tournament leader seems to doubt what to do here. Maybe he's not comfortable with his line. I showed where he has to part with his bishop. And what else? To bring the knight back to f6, ask Ding how he feels about a move repetition with bishop f4 and knight to h5 back. But sort of unlikely they will repeat moves so early on. Should mention, and yeah, the knight does go back. I don't know if this is a quiet draw for, but Ding could deviate now. 
But no, pieces move back and forth. Is this saying, we're friends, we spent all this time during the World Championship match. I don't want to fight or will Ding deviate now by going bishop to d2, let's say, or queen to d3. We'll find out. The players are not allowed to agree to a draw before move 40, but move repetitions, if we have the same position three times on the board, do still lead to draws. So that's normally a shortcut around these rules if such a situation occurs, of course. And here they've repeated the position twice. Ding could now make a draw by going for the third time with bishop to f4. I would guess he's not going to do it. He's a fighter, and even though the player of France, Ding Liren, the world champion with the white pieces, not in the habit of making quick draws. But let's see. And yeah, draw agreed. Anticlimactic bishop to f4 and a threefold repetition. 18 moves. Like I said, these two know each other very well. Probably neither felt like pushing too much. Great first day, four week here rapport, beating Magnus Carlsen, and then quick and easy draw against the world champion. One and a half out of two. Well, yeah. Ding. Maybe it was because of it. playing his friend. Maybe he's still trying to get his feet wet playing quote unquote normal chess again. But quick end to this game, which leaves us with. Two games remaining. Daniel Friedman against Magnus Carlsen and Vincent Keimer against Maxima Schiller-Graf. Let's briefly go to Vincent against MVL. A bunch of things happened. I was wrong, as usual, after knight g7. I said Vincent's going to play it safe with knight b3. But Vincent said, not going to happen. I'll go for blood with knight g5. The critical move, knight to e5, bishop to b3. MVL, who still seems to know this line, is playing very quickly, went knight 7 to c6. I was showing h6, f4 earlier, which looked dangerous. So knight 7 to c6. Asking white to play f4. f4 happens. Black plays bishop to g4. This very much looks like he's still in book. Hitting the queen, but allowing a little tactic in form of bishop takes f7. I guess black's point is if the queen goes somewhere, First of all, it's not obvious where, let's say here, that now he could play h6 and after takes, queen takes. Position would be a mess, but black seems to be doing all right with queen e3, for example. Useful little resource. So instead, after bishop g4, Heimer directly plays bishop takes f7, trying to distract this knight that was covering the bishop. But MVL had anticipated that, or had known this, I think he's still book. Knight takes f7, queen takes g4. When we have material equality, where was pawn down? He's regained that pawn on f7. The black king is weak, but chess is a concrete game, blah, blah. So it's black to move. He goes knight takes g5, ruining the white pawn structure a little bit. f takes g5, threatening a check. Queen to c8, covering that square. See, making all those moves very, very quickly. Queen to g3. White should not go for an endgame here with his slightly broken pawn structure. He has to try to stay active, using the fact that black cannot castle because king is cut off by his wall. Queen to g3. And we are also playing quickly. Queen d7, introducing the option. Castle. Queen side, bring his king to safety there. Timer. Has to keep pushing. He goes pawn to g6. Preparing rook to f7 in case black would castle queenside, which I guess he still should. Not sure what else. You don't want to take here because then queen takes g6 check. It's more than a little unpleasant. And you also don't want to wait passively for rook f7. So I guess long castles. Rook f7, queen d6 is the way to play. Queen shouldn't go anywhere else because that would be 
little checkmate problem on c7. So queen to d6. Now we would get an endgame, looks like white no longer can keep queens on the board. Which probably Maxime knows all this. Yeah, he's castle queen side. Probably it leads to equality, like all these long forcing lines. Takes, takes. Like doesn't seem to have any particular problems. So castle queen side on the board, rook to f7, queen d6. French star showing his homework here. Hangman with the decision. I say you should exchange queens now, actually. Now looking at it, he could go queen h3 check. King to b8 and take this pawn. Would be a pawn on the seventh rank. I'm not sure how long this pawn would survive there after queen to g6. Still, it is an alternative. Like queen g6, queen f5. And things aren't that easy. Like now, recaptures. Maybe he's still fine, but his rook looks a little silly on h7. So it could be that that is a more principled way for Vincent Keimer to play. Asking some questions. Hmm. Using the same logic, actually, now I'm wondering if I'm making any sense. You could also take and then take here. Well, once again, this will, we'll probably have to go to h7. Bring him in. Hmm. We have guests entering the studio. The world champion, Ding Liren, is here, and he's joined by his opponent in the second round, Richard Rapport. Come on in. Do we have microphones for everybody? Excellent. Oh, they have to share. I can give up mine. Let's see. We need, we need a chair. Oh, no, no, All right, here we are with the world champion Ding Liren and his former helper, question mark, and rival in the second round, Rachel Rapport. Look at guys. How was the game? Uh, short game. <laughs> but it's uh, longer than I thought. Ah, okay. 18 moves. <laughs> was it because you know each other too well after you work together or <clears throat> the position you didn't see anything better what happened <laughs> for me i don't think i could do much i don't know playing black playing the money i mean it's kind of bad already <laughs> yeah. and the position also like uh, this is all life for black i mean it's basically seven still be stuff i don't think i just approve it too much so i feel like if i'm deviates from the repetition i just get into trouble yeah. But also, there's no expert here in my I think the computer yeah, was saying. Yeah. Well, I, I remember this not so precise, but we did, but uh, yeah. whatever. Because here, yeah, I think normally if I would just um, a little bit higher and then 
try to place something there with something for ideas, something like that. I don't know. Yeah, you can go bishop d2, it but says it. And F, yeah, yeah play bishop, before they take each other one, yeah. Like, I'm not so sure if black is doing so badly, but well, this is normal stuff. Yeah. Uh -huh. With mess. Yes, yeah, before, back to before at some point, maybe first to keep playing. But not before immediately. And we end up with some. Yeah. Right, it takes. Right, it takes. Fine. If you accept the forward, that looks and it's messy. Well. Hmm. Now did you feel that you didn't want to give the guy too hard a time, or you didn't like your position? Uh -huh. I didn't like my position after I took five. So, Kurok agreed there. Hmm. How does it feel to play this format with two games a day? Is it exhausting, or you feel it's uh, more relaxed than classical? Well, for me, I, I play it almost every, you know, kind of open air, so... Never knows a kind of uh, what I'm used to here in Castle. And also the biggest thing about played here was double rounds. So it's always double rounds. We're used to longer than rounds. Yeah, like exactly. six hours. So for me, this is like relaxing. Yeah, like 45 plus 10 is like, okay, great compared to two hours for 40 and then one hour and then repeat just one more time. And uh, eventually, you're even forced to play with decent opposition and you'll come like open is pretty strong. Yeah. So for me, this rule is fine, especially when I have short games with black games. So holiday, how do you feel about it? Is this the first time you play this two games per day rapid? Yes, maybe in China we also played this and tournament where six plus uh, thirty, thirty plus thirty, then there will be two games in a day. But uh, this rapid format is new to me, and I have to decide if I I should go back to my home after the first event. That's not a worry. Also, I'm also the first one to finish. So now in the end, I go to a park near the building. It's a very nice one. So you, if you have half an hour, you don't uh, run to your laptop and try to prefer, prepare yes. for the next game. <laughs> Let's look at what's happening in the other game. What's Magnus doing? He's sacrificed a piece. What's going on here? Friedman was thinking. What's he thinking about? Is to take him? Is it an error in transmission, or I couldn't ask such questions? So is it, we can is work at the board. I think it should be live, so uh -huh. yeah, okay. it's just thinking. Night execution for his next move. Yeah, I guess if he's forced, mm -hmm. probably that like, will get to play. Syrian would like his name, will get to play before him, so that probably is not, not error worse. I mean, at least I have a feeling that that is kind of definitely even compensation. Yeah. And that seems like it might was probably, yeah, it's already having some additional bonus to the position. Magnus looks happy. How was your game against Magnus? We saw the end, of course, where he blundered a piece, but what happened That's what you're worse before that? Yeah, I went for this technical brilliance with the two. Yeah, it was instantly. No, but the other guy. No, I mean, uh, I, I here I already like lost control over the game. I should have been gone. I felt like before I was putting pressure, um, but this rapid uh, phase kicked me in. And of course, I felt like actually I made a big blunder. I mean, uh, okay, my my wife told me after the game. Of course, I did. But after Knight takes c5, I could have taken queen h5. Yeah, yeah, yeah because bishop takes f6. Yeah, yeah bishop takes f6. Because of course, I thought uh, he has extra options like. Like the same, let's say, I might load it, and it's the same, but of course I drop 6 and it's not the same, so... And I think after Queen H5, if he just retreats with the knight, and it's clearly better there, so attacking as a king, and mm -hmm. everything, so yeah. And after this, I think game was kind of balanced for some time, which is probably mistakes from both sides, I guess, but nothing expected. Yeah, yeah. nothing okay. much happened. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah. Yeah, so here I decided to go for the list. some weird stuff here. Yeah? Like I could have just I mean, played like Rook A7, something taken like 6 if you move on to go. I decided to do this B3. And here I didn't like him to do the 8, so I went to do a little bit playing on time, because I think at this point he was like reasonably long time, like, yeah, yeah, like in the best sequence area. Yeah. And Bishop B7, King H6 was very strong from him. 
I mean, probably other ones are fine, but this was practically very strong. Yeah, his team is safe. Uh, I suggested this, but then yes, I guess I'm nice happy, happy to use. <laughs> So no, it looked like you were both playing well until yeah, and yeah, around here I think we should have just the game should have just fizzled out and played well, yeah. And then I had this uh, yeah, I feel I wanted to go rookie six, it's had been more principled, I guess, but I couldn't make it work after all. Like, like I mean, I want to take on uh, F six right and do some, some some stuff there, but like ninety two, ninety four was happening. I felt like he's on time. Yeah, this uh, I didn't see. Like rookie five. Uh, Nice as three looking five, I didn't see, of course. But I, I'm definitely yeah. not like that's you know any any real chances, but uh, ah, yeah, this yeah, I didn't see it. Put like it's going in, but like okay. yeah, this would have been probably better for the game. And in the game, I think it should be just a draw, more or less. Yes, precise play, and then of course one of us played precise. Like he told me after the game, right? He saw that I had here. Uh, some point on the side, yeah, like rookie yeah, so rookie three. Yeah. Okay. Go after bishop c five. I was the reason I was scared for a second uh, about rook a five, you know, like so I, I managed to allow like rook a five. With the big idea of having three check being, you know, knight takes three checks. So I started to go play this line like king e two, like what's because he doesn't have knight b six yet, and like what's the deal here? Like king got unpings knight b six, like but I have rook b six and all this you know, mm -hmm. stuff. Like I'm not really in danger, and I have some HR checks for a bit. Mm -hmm. Sacrificing so I was not playing this, and then he went to rook c2. So you were in survival mode, and then he gave yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, rook c2, and yeah. then I ended rook seven, of course, like just uh, because same idea, like maybe to rook takes d2, and it's just uh, very strong. And then I went to d3, and then you know, the rest is history. But like, <laughs> of course, every move draws except uh, the one that he chose. So very lucky game for me. Does he feel good to beat Magnus, or you think if he blunders a piece? Yeah, I'm not really used to beating Magnus, so I guess uh, I guess it feels good, yeah. But um, overall, yeah, the, I mean, I didn't really outplay him. Maybe I posed some problems over overall, yeah, like I had some chances, but whenever I had a chance, I felt like I had him sleep. So overall, the quality of my game was not, you know, too high or whatever. I don't know, but like, yeah, of course, I'm very happy. I had the feeling with Magnus that he tends to start slowly, yeah, in tournament. So I was not uh, too unhappy to play him this right in the first game, uh, to put it this way. And I'm sure like uh, you know, he will start to get back to his usual self and start uh, stream, stream rolling the field. Maybe even this game, I don't know, looks very interesting was against the Netherlands. Yeah, anyway, congratulations. Never easy to be Magnus even in round number one. So how is your guys' relationship? You've spent a lot of time together, I guess, during the World Championship match. Have you stayed in touch? Are you still working or have you had enough of each other and said, you break from this guy? Yeah, we still we, we chat uh, through the WeChat software and uh, some during the holidays, we congratulations each other. Oh, okay. Yeah, so we still have in touch. Okay, that's good to hear. And what's your, your plans for this year? And will you, will you be playing more chess? What's the schedule? Schedule will be no HS for the next tournament and then maybe Olympiad. Okay. And uh, of, of course, uh, in the end of this year, we have World Championship match. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a uh, uh, for busy schedule for me. I mentioned. Uh, it's very good to see you back in business. And um, well, before I let you go, just tell me very quickly what's happening in the Magnus game it's still. Mm -hmm. Same standard, yeah, takes, takes, mm -hmm. I guess if you ask the engine, it's very boring. The engine says work at 300, but... No, I mean, uh, I guess by this probably fine, but overall, yeah, it feels kind of depressing, because even with the piece up, you can never really play an advantage, I mean, against this pass. Now even engine is no longer happy. Yeah, okay, I mean, if you get the pawns rolling, yeah, I mean, there's nothing in front of the visual that's... Uh, not a bad thing. But I'm not so sure if objectively like this, you know, claiming something just yet. Because still, yeah, that is with another solid thing will be parts to this the queen side and he should be able to block the bounce eventually. Or at least that's in theory. And then you know you will see in practice uh, what happens. We'll find out. Thank you so much for joining. Enjoy an early dinner and yeah, best of luck for the rest of the tournament. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay.
Yes. Not sure if I'm still mic'd up. We're just taking a minute here to reposition. And two more games left in this second round. Of course, Magnus Carlsen, after his peace sacrifice, looking for his first win here versus Daniel Friedman. While in the other game, I think we've looked at this position. We have a roughly equal end game. Still some tension, but for now, roughly equal between. Vincent Keimer and Maxime Vachela Graf. Maxime Vachela Graf with a better pawn structure, but Keimer is a little more active because of this silly rook on h7. So we'll keep an eye on that. But for now, let's look at Friedman versus Carlsen, where Magnus faces the decision how to proceed after he sacrificed a piece to get these past pawns, like Richard was explaining. And I'm afraid we'll have to try to block those. Easier said than done. Queen H4 check. King has to go. And the pawns will start moving. To plate. Shooter Manson mentions F3 check, which is not a move I would think of giving up the pride of the black position here. And yeah, Carlson plays G4, which is just as good and a lot more natural, preparing F3. And also potentially G3. Very tough for Daniel to play. He has to get his king to safety and he has to make sure these guys don't queen. His pieces aren't so close to the action. Like Bishop D2 looks normal to me, but then the pawns just keep rolling. F3, King D1, and G3. When after Rook takes F3, Black wins material with Queen H1 check, King E2, Queen G2, and this Rook is gone. So. Not easy to do. Instead, Friedman plays king to d1, gets out of all potential checks, keeps his options open. I guess the black pawns will still be pushed. You want to start with f3 because after g3, white could block the pawns with queen to f3, and white would be better. So that's not going to happen. But after pawn to f3, it still looks very, very tough for Friedman to keep these guys under control. And yeah, pawn to f3 on the board. Also easier to play for black. You just run and you tell white you figure it out. Pompey is not too worried for white yet. He says black is a bit better, as you can see by the engine bar there, but not by much. It says bishop e3. G3, just king c2, and relax, but not easy to relax when these guys are storming up the board. But yeah, computer gives something like this, saying white can still survive. Doesn't seem easy. Friedman plays king to c2, trying to get his king away from the action, and he's preparing after g3 to now be able to take because there would be no more check on h1, like with the king on d1. But Carlsen can start with f2, and then bring the other pawn. Also, f2 creates the option of going rook f3, bring the other rook before running. So it does look like Magnus's risky strategy will probably pay off here. Yeah, f2 played.
tremendously unpleasant or sleep on Fun fact, or I don't know if it's fun, computer fact. Computer says the best play for white is queen e2, rook f3, and now, not the most obvious move in the world, queen takes f3, giving a whole queen for rook, just to make sure these pawns no longer run, takes in bishop e3. White would at least gain modicum of stability here, get rid of this pawn, and all of a sudden the white pieces are much more harmonious. The drawback is you have to give the queen and very hard when you're a piece up to come up with a decision like that to give a whole queen. But amazing resource there, courtesy of Mr. Stockfish. Daniel looks calm. Spot that is also very strange to move the queen, which could take on f3 directly, one step away first and then to take. I guess the problem is after other moves are enough. C5. Black is not going to play rook f3, but play g3 instead. She could do after queen e2 as well, but then white's coordination improves with bishop to e3, these pawns. Very far advanced, but not queening just yet. So a lot of tough decisions here for Friedman. He starts with bishop e3, then rook f3. It's very unpleasant once again, pinning this bishop. Now there's no more time for queen e2. It's black. Just brings all the resources, rook f8. And then pushes the pawn up the board. Queen to played, best move by Daniel Friedman. He's showing he's not intending to go down without a fight here. I'm wondering if, should rook f3 happen? He's seen this spectacular idea with queen takes f3. Carlson has a choice, g3, also very natural. Take one moment because I think we missed a couple moves here earlier. Friedman tried to keep it closed on the king side by going pawn to g4 after Carlson started this typical pawn storm here. Compi said just go c5. Compi is a compi and Carlson wasted no time sacrificing a piece on g4 to get this position we're dealing with now with the two pass pawns. For the piece and after queen two rook f3 is not happening yet. Magnus is weighing his options. Yes, g3 is sort of more normal, but then after bishop e3, it's not so easy to think of a follow up because g2 does not yet do anything, white just takes and the rook still controls this queening square. Therefore, yeah, he does play rook f3 indeed, trying to invite everyone to the party, preparing rook f8, and then once both rooks cover this f2 square, g3 followed by g2 would be a big threat. And now is the big moment. Is Friedman going to sacrifice his queen? It's not like he's better after. He's actually worse, but it is the best chance to stay in the game. Tremendous resource. Queen takes f3. Followed by bishop to e3. Just giving the queen or just a rook. Not even a pawn for now, but to neutralize these passers. And all of a sudden, white's position looks harmonious, even though to fight against the queen is still not exactly fun. Let's see. If he does it, if he doesn't, it looks like black's play will be Fairly straightforward. Rook f8, g3, g2 will be a threat in the white place. Let's say bishop d2, which looks normal. Rook f8 and rook h1, trying to bother with the black queen. Then there's rook to h3, blocking the way. And once again, this pawn just rolls. So Daniel 
probably has to find this, which first you have to think of it, and then you have to find the courage or the desperation to do it. Not an easy spot for the man from Bochum. Yes, he still is in Bochum. Middle of Germany, not that far from Karlsruhe, where we are. And he does play Bishop E3, plays a quote unquote normal move. But now the black play becomes a lot easier. Rook to F8. Freeman takes on A7, takes the pawn. Is he going to stop these pawns? What's his point after pawn to G3? Ah, then he wants rook A8. That's the trick. Ah. Point is after pawn to g2. Now rook takes f8, eliminates one of the defenders. Getting ahead of us, ourselves, but Carlson plays g3 and rook a8 blitzed out by Friedman. Tremendous resource, and g3 was actually a mistake from the Rapid World Champion, according to Mr. Computer, of course. Computer says you could have gone. Rook takes e3, queen takes e3, and then g3, making sure this rook is no longer attacked. Therefore, there's no rook a8. And now g2 is unstoppable. Black would have won the game. But Carlsen plays a natural move, pawn to g3. And after rook a8, Daniel Friedman is back in business. Tremendous little trap he found here. Carlsen fell for it with 22 minutes on the clock. Maybe moved a little too quickly, pawn to g3. Thought the game was over. Well, now, after rook a8, it's a mess once again. Anything could happen. Agnes won't be happy that he failed to end this game, which looked like it was already in the back. But yeah, kudos to Friedman for spotting this trick. And luring Magnus to go for this. It's not like black is in trouble, but there seems to be no direct win, for example. Rook takes a8, queen takes f3, and let's say queen to h3 looks logical. When rook takes f2, runs into rook f8. But somehow... White barely is coordinated enough to hang in there. Agnos so far won't be thrilled with his first day, losing the first game to a blunder, and here he had done the heavy lifting, but then moved too quickly, allowed this rook a8, and now he has to win this game all over again. Because without a pair of rooks, let's say, I don't know, rook somewhere takes, whatever it takes. All of a sudden, white has enough pieces in the vicinity here to neutralize these pawns. Let's say we should have two gf and knight to d1. White would have given the piece back, but stabilizing it would no longer be worse. So there's no. No trivial way for Carlson. Mm. Make it out of here. does not look like he's overly bothered by the proceedings still. Leaning back at Magnus Calculate. He's not shaking his head or anything, but I guess he's kicking himself a little bit for allowing this G3 rook a8 resource. Should show. Let's get that G2. Now it's just not in time. Rook takes F8. 
rook takes and rook takes f2. Black gets a queen. There's a check. The bishop takes here. Well, the bishop takes f8. It runs into similar problems. Rook takes f2. G1, queen, let's say. And now after queen takes f3, or rook takes f3, but black would have two queens, but he'd be in, he'd be in trouble. Rook g2 check is a threat. Queen f7, queen f8, all of a sudden. White is completely coordinated and has too many attackers. And even if black hangs in here for a bit, this would not be a welcome change. I'm trying to figure out why this is so terrible for black. Computer says it's completely waiting for white. Okay, white has a rook and a knight for the queen, so he's not that much material down. His king is safe. Is his passer. Interesting. Axelson. Yeah. And one move too quickly here, pawn to g3, allowing this tremendous result with rook a8. I've mentioned rook takes e3 was winning the game. Takes and now pawn to g3. There's nothing you can do about g2 next. Rook a8, you can just take now. And there were also other moves like bishop to h6. Takes and queen takes once again. The march of the tree pole cannot be stopped anymore. It's played by far the most logical move, g3. Now, he's been thinking for the last five, six minutes. Here says zero, zero. There's no, no win anymore. Yeah, you can see Magnus slightly upset. Chess is a horrible game. Carlson keeps studying the position. Let's briefly check in with Vinny K against MVL. Where a bunch of things have happened since we first saw this endgame. We left it somewhere around here, gh7, rook f1, pawn to b6, rook to c1, rook to d7, exchanging a pair of rooks. Might looks to be doing all right, but... On d4 is very vulnerable now. White can first go h4, g4 if needed. Still doesn't look like black should be in too much trouble. But the computer is not unhappy about white's position. Gives him a small plus here. Looks like five would be two. But we have action in the other game. So let's go there. After rook a8, Carlson. So I'm thinking when rook takes a8, queen takes f3, and he's played queen to h3, hoping for rook takes f2, rook f8. But why does other moves? Rook to h1, or even queen to d1. When these pawns are stopped for now, I guess the line they have to calculate is rook h1, rook to f8. And queen takes f8, king takes, rook takes, black gets a queen, white takes, and evaluate this. What is this? Once again, black has a rook and a knight for the queen. The queen can even take another pawn here. But it seems like white is stable enough to keep the balance. Partly because Black's bishop is so bad. This knight doing a tremendous job covering all the pawns and taking all the checking squares from the Black Queen. So Daniel will be thinking about that. He doesn't like it because he will have to give the Queen in that line. 
You could also play queen back to d1. When the pawn is after g2, and you can take and now take the pawn. But then he has to evaluate what happens if black plays more slowly. Rook f8, just again, once again, trying to prepare the push of these pawns. So, still not easy for white to make decisions here. Can you also go queen e2, or is that bad? That's bad, because now. I know that black just gets a queen and emerges with an extra exchange rook for a knight. That's not, not enough play for what. Big decision for Friedman, he's calculating. Yes, practically easier said than done. Uh, if you calculate all this, um, this would be a good path because this makes the position a lot less messy and a little easier to play. And again, you have to deal with this queen. Has some Crowley focused. Freeman has time to calculate. He's right to take the time here. This decision. So crucial for our game. We'll go. Queen d1 seems to be okay, but that doesn't release the tension. So that feels like a very hard move to make. I'm sure he's trying to calculate the consequences of this rook at one line. And evaluate if he's safe there at the end. With the missing queen. He does that. Let's switch to Vincent Keimer versus Maxim Vashila Graf for a second. Hmm. Vincent with the white pieces, yeah. He said this. Tremendous results in the World Rapid Championship 2022, where he finished second. Also drawing MVL there, I think, in the last round from a position of strength with the black pieces. So he's shown he can play with the best of them in rapid but of course also created a lot of expectations in the last world rapid championship didn't go so well in 2023 where he ran out of steam down the stretch the good tournament but keeps improving his rating recently broke 2740 in classical chess then he's had a rougher tournament in the prague it's called the prague masters last month Lost some rating again. Uh, of course, the big, big hope of German chess. Vincent Keimer, 90 years young, trying to win this endgame against a longtime French top player, Maxime Bachelard Graf. Give him the look, Vincent. We need a little stare down. No. Yep, that's the one. It was too quick, he didn't see it. That we see. 
It's a time. Rocking the Nick Carter haircut. Sure, that's a reference Vincent's very familiar with. And, and yeah, looking for his first victory here. But Maxime, tremendously strong. Practical player, end game player, great, great calculator. Will be very, very tough. To defeat from here, Maxime, weighing his options. Also, as usual, Vincent, down on the clock, which here is very understandable because MVL blitzed out the first, I think, 20 moves, and Vincent had to find his way through this opening maze. Although we have to, we have to ask some questions because the pairings were known in advance. It's well known. MVL plays this line with the black pieces almost ex exclusively now. So, what's going on there, Vincent? No. Could argue he got a small advantage with white, so probably not much to criticize. But it took him a long time. Maxime is calculating now if he should exchange rooks, rook c2, rook d2, if he can take, he should go rook c1. Yeah, he goes rook c1. He's probably rightly decided that the pure knight end game is not great for him because it's going to be very hard to coordinate his pieces here. Well, white can always target this pawn. Since that rook c1 was played, I think I don't mind if you take here. I will have enough come to play with my active rook. Once again, guessing is true. Something like this. So king e5 first. Looks like it should end peacefully. Question is, can Kaima find a way to prolong the game? Or well, he can prolong the game by taking, but to put even more pressure, I don't know. If we play with like a3, black doesn't have to do anything. I think all these work end games. Should be drawish enough. Yeah, always has enough come to play. But let's switch. To Friedman Carlson, where Friedman, after some contemplating, has gone for rook to h1. Did he? How did we get here? Apologies for a second. Yeah, he played rook h1, rook f8 by Carlson. And instead of queen takes f8, which was this funky computer line with the queen sacrifice, he went for rook takes h3, which, yes, is a more human decision, but now he's forced to give him a piece, and the g-pawn stays alive. Carlson goes for pawn to g2. Compi, by the way, didn't like g2, wanted rook f3, threatening g2. Russell looks very nasty. But g2 played rook g3. King to f7, unpinning the bishop. What is this? G pawn, of course, is a menace. Black would love to bring his bishop into the action somehow. Apparently, white is still fine if he goes for very quick counterplay with pawn to c5. Too complicated for me, so I'll just tell you the computer line. It's bishop h6, pawn to b5. Trying to create his own passer here. And yeah, b5 played. No, c5 played. Kudos to Friedman. Not going down without a fight. So the line I was going to show is bishop h6, threatens something like bishop e3, I would think. Yeah, pawn to b5. If black goes, let's say, bishop e3, then all of a sudden it's white. We break through here. b6 takes and c6. And the white c-pawn is the most dangerous free pawn on the board. So Carlson would have to react to this b5. If b5 happens, that's just a computer line. It's not easy at all. With d takes c5, white should sacrifice sir. <laughs> another pawn 
to create counter play here. Once again, with this runner, white is very much in business. Has his other options he could take here. He could go bishop f8, but nothing that seems to be decisive. So Daniel keeps fighting. So this was a chance. Probably Carlson rejected it because rook h4, trying to go rook g4. But then, once again, brought to you by our friend the computer. This apparently was a better version for black with this rook so passive. Black would have been in time. Well, now, Friedman has a real chance to save this with his counterplay on the queen side. Looks lost, but apparently it is not. What's the clock here? Both sides still have time. I'd not be used to playing against Magnus Carlsen, but he's a tremendously experienced rep player. Nice. Lots and lots of rep tournaments. He's always been a specialist. About to move the bishop, but where's it going? H6, F8. He plays bishop F8. He's melt that after bishop H6, pawn to B5. There's enough counterplay. And the point of bishop F8 is white tries the same breakthrough. Now after B5, he can take and D6. There's bishop takes D6. And while. Add the bishop onto h6, and this line seemed to be working nicely. But bishop f8, of course, is a more passive move, not really threatening anything. Friedman could try to play pawn to c6, then rush with b5, b6. Once again, would give us a bit of a race. Bishop h6, pawn to b5, and now bishop e3 would work, keeping an eye on the b6 square. And on the g1 square, threatening, yes. Rook to d2 mainly. And here it seems like black would be in time. Incredibly complicated stuff. But why is not forced to do this? White could play king c4, keeping his options open. Or he could play pawn to c6, bishop to h6. Can't even explain this move. Rook to g4. Not smart enough for that. What's the point? Bishop 3, knight d1. Still don't get it. Two. Ah, this is not losing. Ooh. Ooh. That's, I think, possible. To spot this rook g4 move. So probably. The human way to stay in the game is king to c4. And let's try to make sense of this line. c6, bishop h6. The knight goes to d1 directly. And there's bishop to f4. Or also, now this is more logical. Rook f3. <laughs> I'm not sure if more logical is actually. <laughs> Pretty cute as well. Rook takes f3 check. And now bishop to f4. Yeah, the pawn can't be stopped. Black wins. Pawn to b5, trying to break through. Then bishop to e3. 
stops the pawn, like wins. But if white starts with this, rook g4, apparently is in time. Bishop f4, then b5. Once again, trying to break through. Now if bishop e3, knight to d1, and white somehow saves himself. But yeah, these lines are incredibly complicated, and rook g4 is too tough a move. So I would hope for Daniel's sake that he doesn't play c6, but plays king c4, which gives him some more options. Probably a tough position, but kudos to Daniel Friedman for hanging in there in this roller coaster against an angry Magnus Carlsen who sacrificed peace. And just tried to crush him. Daniel's mesh. Keep it messy. In the other game, nothing too dramatic has happened, although I'm sure it's also tremendously complicated. Just as I said it, Maxim gives a pawn. And Keimer played some quite improving moves. King to f2. And MVL loses patience, goes knight to e5 here, saying, please take my pawn with check. Tough decision. Knight takes d4, he has to go somewhere with the king. Knight f3 back. Yes, black is selective enough, but there is potential here for drama with the white e pawn also being it. So, not as much drama as in the Freeman game. So, we'll focus on that one. Agnes Carlson after a tough, tough start to this tournament, hanging a piece against Richard Rapport. Now it looked like he was on the verge of victory. But missed. One very good chance to end the game quickly. Then one more hidden one. Now, not anything could happen, but it is messy because white has come to play. Magnus checking the screens above him, see what's happening in the other games. Looks impatient. Make a move, Daniel. But Daniel's right to take his time here. It's another big decision between c6 and king c4. And I guess c takes d6 is also an option. Uh, because c takes d would give white a passer again. And bishop takes d6 would take this bishop sort of off its preferred path. But after the bishop takes d6, it's still hard for white to create any more counterplay. So I'm guessing it's not on Friedman's top two list of moves in this position. Still, so we shall find out within the next eight minutes and 20 seconds. I got nothing. Just watching Daniel think. I guess is that this position is still so much harder to play for White that Magnus remains a big favorite. But he's let him escape a couple of times in this game. I 
Friedmann. Long term German national team player. When we won, humble break and coming. Not even humble. The 2011 European Team Championship. Both Daniel and I were on the team on lower boards, holding the fort. Always been tremendously solid player. Great chess culture, well educated, very, very tough to beat. He's always been a great team player. He has been on the team recently, but not that far away, I think, is classical rating. It's dropped a bit to like 2575, especially in rapid. Still, very much a force to be reckoned with, as we can see here. And he did play King C4, which, as mentioned, seemed like the best practical decision because he lines up to C6, Bishop H6. Looked impossible to find. Well, now the play is a little more straightforward. Once again, after bishop h6, white should go for b5, and after d takes c5. So the same breakthrough with d6 and b6. Mm -hmm. Therefore, yeah. He's putting the owners of Magnus to calculate, find something. Because plays bishop h6. He's arguing that the king is worse on c4 than on b3. Probably because he has rook b2 in one of these lines. Like, like say, let's say takes d6, takes b6 here with the king on b3. The rook can't go here. Well, now it can. But this position remains far from clear. This still very unclear. White can convert. If black can convert this, Compi says it's still equal. But it's go time. Computer keeps saying this weird move, rook g4 is a good move, but I, I just don't get it. Tip my hat if he plays it. How do you come up with such? Well, b5 at least is understandable. Run, create a passer, hope for the best. Meanwhile, in Keimer MVL, Vincent Keimer has managed to outsmart Maxim Vashila Graf, which is extremely hard to do in an endgame like that. The knight e5, yeah, Maxim lost patience a little bit somewhere around here, starting with his knight e5. But it seemed like it was more prudent to just keep pushing pawns. Probably didn't want to wait for white to play g4, h5. But apparently, that was the way. Plate 95 gave this pawn with check. Knight e2, nice little maneuver. Bring this knight over to c3 and d5 if needed. Rook b1, knight c3, rook b2. Attending the fork after rook takes. But Vincent was ready. And it turns out that this knight end game is good for white. With the pawn up. And this horsey here controls the entire queen side. Looks like White is winning this, no? G4, reminding him King can't run too far away because of the H passer. King F6. Now, how do you do this? C3 takes. Check. Takes the A point drops. White should win slowly. So it looks like Vince Kamen is doing well. We'll get back to this. Let's stay with the Friedman Carlson action for now. Pawn to B5 on the board. Once again, best human decision, Diane Friedman. He's playing this end game tremendously so far. He takes C. Intending to break through with d6. Keep asking questions. Slightly surprising that black doesn't have anything here with the pawn on g2. Why is just in time? Should be three is a move that keeps tempting me. Then this breakthrough is just so strong. b6 takes c6. Would completely ruin black's position. So Magnus also has to be careful. 
best guess is we will see this line d takes c onto d6, c takes d onto b6, rook to b2, knight to d5. Now the moves are knight d5, actually, even b7 is possible. Exchange this. Something like this. And now that we evaluate, that remains tremendously complicated. Thinking long and hard. A line that looks nice is not in time to go. But this, once again. Fight through is so strong. Takes c6. Now c7 is a big, big threat, let's say. G1 queen. Takes takes. This pawn can't be stopped. What has he done? Yeah, he does take d takes c. Pawn to d6. There comes the breakthrough. This line we expected. Well played by both sides. On to b6, rook to b2. And now it's a decision for Friedman. He goes b7, I think, yeah. Saying, I don't want to mess around with knight d5, leave this pawn alive. I'd like to trade my b pawn for your g pawn. And even if I'm two pawns down, then my pieces will be so much more active and suited to, for the structure that I should survive. Not sure those were his exact words, but he's right. Even white would be two points down, even though white would be two points down. With all his pieces active and ready to attack the black pawns, it looks like white should survive this. Sure, Magnus will find a way to ask a question, but objectively, my eyes see. Zero, zero, zero. Open hand. And the line is showing. Active white is Hassan's in deep thought, but he can't do much. But taking, I would think, I has bishop d2. Is that a move? So rook g2, rook b4, and bishop c3. He has a check first for before check. Why lure the king to d5? Was king shouldn't return. So the king d3, c4 check. Black pawns would be. Mm -hmm. Unblocked. You need the king to do business here. The king d5 should happen. Still wondering why Magnus felt this helped him. Takes, takes. Ah, maybe he wants rook b3 now and he saw he can transpose after king c4, rook b4. Sorry. I'm talking to myself, trying to figure this out. So possibly he saw it will end up in this position anyway. It's just. Pulling around a little bit on the way. Not sure. Surprising, normally two pawns up in an endgame are sufficient for a victory. 
fact here, it's the worst case scenario with this dark square bishop, all pawns on dark squares being blocked by the white pieces, white controlling these squares around the pawns, where even two pawns are enough, aren't enough. Cast plays rook b6, covers the pawn, and want to keep the knight out of this square, cross the king here. Let's see how Friedman plays this. He could go back, preparing to dump with his knight somewhere, or he could try to activate his rook, like rook a2. Does that make sense? Check here. Does look like Daniel Friedman after an easy draw in the first game against Vincent Keimer is also on the way to jinx him. But to neutralize Magnus Carlsen in this one, where he had to dodge quite a few more than dangerous situations right now. Position is simplified. Daniel is a very strong end game player. He should survive. In the other game, we've missed a couple thousand moves. And it looks like Maxim Vashila Graf should survive as well. Question mark. Still pawn down, but with two pawns against one, these things are usually drawn. You have six. H6, King G6. Left the white king. Trace too far away. Like, will I have some counterplay with? Sorry, knight to e5. Targeting this pawn. Vincent will cry, of course, but it looks like it's right. And MVL goes king e4, doesn't even bother about putting his king. Passive, stays active with the king. After h6, what does he do? And then he, he hustles back. Only move that good enough. So now it looks like we're headed for three draws. Can't say they were particularly boring though. It's a timer. Let's have a look. If he missed a chance somewhere around here, pawn to h5, pawn p. He's very unhappy about it. Once knight c3 or knight c7. Keeping the structure flexible. And after h5, g5. Now, knight c3 was played. Won't be still happy for white. Still happy. Oh, 94, not happy. <clears throat> oh, this sounds way, way over my head. So, read out knight to d3 was the way. Targeting this pawn. And then after b4. Apparently, why is not time? Bring the king. Support b2. White sacrifices his knight. Now, with with the three pawns remaining. Okay, tremendously complicated stuff. Apparently, it very much looks like MBL. So I. Yeah. So it looks slightly annoyed. I think. It's realized it's a draw. It's known all along. So let's stick with Daniel Friedman. <clears throat> Oops. Will not be let go by Magnus Carlsen just yet. Apparently. Okay, seven check. What was natural movement in the world? It was wrong. He should have. Kept the rook here to keep his construction stable. Armchair general. King f6, what's going on? King c4, rook b4, king d5. Should d2. This construction breaks. You have six on the board.
Four check. And back. Now bishop d2 seems to be the problem now that the knight can't access this square. State goes here. Oof, still tremendously complicated. Trick is rook b3. Pawn gets taken. Rook e3 trying to dominate. This poor horsey. Yeah, that's why apparently it was better. Keep the rook close. It looks like there's not a lot of progress to be made for black. Something like this. Knight Eckes. That's why. Yeah, castle spot bishop d2. See his expression changed there. Hmm. He's going to grind it out after all. Big, big fight. Now it goes to e2. And now look, b3. Very, very tough. Right, dominate. This horsey or re emerges on a different path. It's going to do it. Mm -hmm. Shaking his head doesn't seem convinced yet. Rook B3 played best move. Agnes Carlson showing us why he's considered by some the best endgame player of all time. Putting pressure here. Rook B3. Cutting the knight off. He takes D6. Rook to E3. I will have to go here, g1, and now the way is cleared for the c pawn with this sorry horse locked up. C pawn as well. Sad for Daniel Friedman after such a great fight and multiple comebacks within the same game. He does seem to be going down after all. But of course, gotta give credit to Magnus as well, who, yeah, missed some chances, but always found ways to keep the game going, create new problems. That's why he's the best. And all of this after this blunder he had in round one against Laporte. Carlson starting with two black games here. But if he manages to win this one, the damage has been admitted. Meanwhile, Vince Keimer is still trying to convert his extra pawn against Maxima Schiller Graf, moving his knight. All the squares on the board. The problem is, it's hard to threaten anything. Even here, once the H pawn gets rolling, it's still not really going to queen as long as the knight covers the H8 square. 
sorry, the H is where it's here. Uh, the king can always come back to help. It's like black is in time. Vincent now does go H6. He had to try it at some point. I bring the king back, putting the knight in the corner, and going after the pawn. Seems to save our point. Yeah, Maxim Vashila, bro. Tremendous defender. Used to all these terrible group of endgames. He's, he's incredibly good at putting things together. Daniel Friedman keeps fighting, goes rook a2. This should be four. King takes d6. Still not making life easy, but now Carlson is in the zone. Goes rook d3 check, blocking the king away. King to c6, and he activates his king. Strictly only moves. Even rook d3 and king g5 show how close this is. Which I still can't even process it. I can just read out. Carlson seems very dedicated to not let go. King g4, king c4, now rook d1 keeps the king cut off, and also the knight. Beautiful domination, actually. All the pieces are teaming up to control this knight squares. Next would be king to f3. When Does look like the job is done. Either the knight or the e pawn or both would fall. Try knight c1, then king takes c4. And this is a different two pawns up situation. Yeah, big, big fight by Daniel Friedman, showing his class. And yet, Magnus Carlsen manages to grind him down here. Now, yeah, I think there's no more chance for Daniel. King takes e4 plate. The rookie 2, king f3. So he has to try jump with the knight. Now this pawn is too fast, let's say. King f3 or king e3. And it takes... I can just take yeah, a one rook end game with his king cut off. This runs. Mm -hmm. Said rook d3 is played. Doesn't spoil anything. Pawn still can't be taken. Still boxed out. E3 is his point. C1. Now you can take, then run with the e pawn or go king of three directly by a castle takes. Doesn't hesitate. He's got this figured out. King f3, knight g1, king g2, knight e2, king f2. Check. Yeah. Tough, tough game for him. Um, to such a comeback. King d5, but 
Not much help for King of One and King Two. Yeah. He resigns. Mm -hmm. Angus Carson stays in contention, moves back to 50% after a big fight. And the other game, also over at the exact same moment where Vincent Keimer tried for a long, long time to grind down Maxima Sheila Graf, made great progress in the end game, but on move 71, he had to abandon his winning attempts because Maxima. I think flawlessly once they came to this two versus one end game and spotted the right defense that the knight can stay passive and block the h pawn with a black king can stay active. Once white starts moving the h pawn, then the king rushes back and goes to control this guy. The game was drawn. I needed two minutes bathroom break. Um, we can come back after that and see if we have any guests to tell us what happened in their games. So let's go on a brief break and then come back either to say goodbye or with one of the players. Thanks for watching. I grew up in the small fortress town of Wurde. I've lived here all my life. When I was five, my father taught me the game. And so I grew up in a small fortress town of Wood. I've lived here all my life. I can't really remember my life without When chess. I was five, my father I taught me like the game. It's always been there. And soon thereafter, I took me to the local chess club. I met my wife through chess. I my profession can't really remember my chess. life without chess. I feel like it's always been there. I don't I play chess my wife to chess. win. I'm not that competitive with chess. Uh, I love how the pieces move, I love the game. I love how everything I don't play chess to win. Still win. I'm not that competitive. When I'm uh, behind I the chessboard, the move, I time the game. doesn't flow the same way. I love how everything Until around me out. becomes still. When I'm behind the chessboard, in the spring of 2021, doesn't flow time the same way. to have run out. Until I diagnosed with Hodgkin's disease, which is a form of cancer. I was in 35. the spring of 2021, and suddenly time seemed to have run out. Changed. I was diagnosed with Hodgkin's disease. It was a strange time, and chess didn't seem to matter I was at 35. all. 35, and suddenly my life changed. It was, was a strange optimistic. time, and I chess uh, didn't seem to matter at all. The treatment plan and the doctors that were helping me, and uh, I felt it was in their But I was optimistic. Now. I the uh, chemotherapy, radiation, the treatment plan, uh, and the doors that, that were helping me walk around the and uh, I felt it was in their hands now. That it really puts things in perspective. The chemotherapy, like, like, radiation, uh, if I have a bad position uh, now, doors, yeah, I could barely <laughs> walk around the it's, it's no big deal, uh, you know? So maybe that in that really sense it puts things in perspective. That, that like, you have a like, more of a, um, if I have a bad position now, uh, yeah, yeah. Different kind of <laughs> attitude. It's, to, it's no big deal, to, uh, uh, you know? So maybe in that sense it helps. That, that you have a more of a, uh, a different kind of attitude to There to, are definitely also positive things I take from that time when I was not uh, well. Uh, I think it gives you There are definitely on life also on, on positive things I take from that time when I was uh, not uh, well. It was definitely not only uh, um, negative. I think it gives you kind of different perspective on life, on, on it takes a long time to recover, uh, but chess players it was definitely are only uh, negative. It, it was crazy because one month before the tournament in Vegas, I still had it my It takes a long time to recover, but finished. chess players are so anything it was way too early actually to... It, it was crazy like because I, one month I wanted to desperately before be the tournament, tournament in Vegas, I still had my I barely prepared for the games. I was just too tired. So it was way too early to start playing. I went back to my room. I wanted to slept most of the time at that tournament. I had put that I barely prepared for the games as because a, I was um, just too tired. I just I only played the games. I had dinner, went back to my room, slept most Best of the time. I, ever played. I had put that tournament as an. Um, then at the end of the year, after a goal. Um, 16 field attempts, I uh, became Dutch Best champion. Tournament I ever played. And that was really the cherry on, on the cake. That was then at the end of the year, after uh, 16 that's field attempts, the feeling of yeah, I'm back. Dutch champion. And that was really the cherry on, on the cake. 
that was all those yeah, was failures, ecstatic. all those setbacks, uh, they, uh, the feeling of never setting back matter now. What is important is that uh, I have a lot of chess all those ahead of me. Failures, all those setbacks, they uh, never. I always to wait for the moment now. when what is important uh, I is wake that up and uh, I, I realize chess I ahead of me. I don't really feel like looking at chess, but it just never happens. I always wait for the moment when uh, I wake up and. I realize that I uh, my name today is I don't really feel like looking at just your mouse. Never happens. My name is Erwin Lamy and I'm a Dutch grandmaster. Welcome back everybody. We are done with round number two of the Frankie Chess Classic. And we can see Vincent Keimer. And Magnus Kalf, no, that's not Magnus, that is Maxime Schiller-Graf, are deciding to play some Blitz after they're done? Are they analyzing? Well, this looks like Blitz. We've been informed that Magnus Carlsen has responsibilities talking to the Norwegian TV. Some people are out there chasing him, but it does look like... Getting mixed signals here. Um, <clears throat> So, we'll find out. In the meantime, let's look at tomorrow's pairings and the current standings before moving on. Not getting any standings, so we will do it. Um, hi, here we are. We've seen Magnus lost to Rika Rapport, but then he came back to defeat Daniel Friedman. Those were the only two decisive games, which, according to my math, means Rapport leads, Friedman is lost, and everybody else is on 50%. In round number three, what do we have? We don't know if it's fine to we'll figure it out tomorrow. Here we see the playing all of the open still abandoned, but the day after tomorrow, this will convert itself into the biggest chess tournament. Hmm. In at least Karlsruhe, and I think Europe, with 2,700 people uh, lined up, and I'm getting word that the main people out there trying to catch Magnus, lure him into this beautiful studio, have failed, and therefore we will try to get him. Another one of these days, there we see Vincent and Maxime still analyzing their game, which ended in a draw. And that means we'll wrap it up for today. Thank you so much for watching the show. We'll see if tomorrow we'll get Peter Laker to join us, but he sounded very, very sick, so no promises there. Tomorrow, same time, same place, 3 p.m. with rounds number three and number four. Thanks for watching. See you then.